Hey, grade nines. Um, so this is the second part of um, unit four, lesson two. Uh, so going over how to solve equations algebraically. So what we're going to do today is just kind of focus on um, the rest of the slideshow here. So we finished off uh, slide seven last time, uh, where we talked about how to solve equations where there are variables on both sides. Now we're moving on to a couple of like the more special cases, I guess you could say, or different strategies that we can try when solving equations. So let's uh, take a look. So another strategy you might want to try is using something called distributed property. And this is mainly going to come up when you have brackets. Uh, so essentially the rule of thumb here is if an equation has brackets, then it's very likely, uh, not all the time, because we will. there are some examples, and I believe in the homework where doesn't happen, uh, but the majority of the time, it's best to expand the brackets, which basically means you're using distributed property. Uh, so distributed property just means that I take what is outside the monomial outside and multiply by what, what is inside. Uh, so let's look at an example here. Uh, so if I wanna solve this equation, I have first noticed obviously there are two sets of brackets. So what I'm gonna do first um, is I'm going to expand out my brackets by multiplying the monomial four by X and multiplying the, mono, the monomial four by negative two. Uh, so if I multiply 4 times x, and I'll do it right underneath here, I get 4x, that's pretty easy. And 4 times negative 2, just be careful with the math here, it gives me negative 8. Um, and we're going to follow the same step over here. We're going to take negative 3, and then we multiply by 2x, that gives us negative 6x. And then we take negative 3 and multiply by 6, which gives us negative 18. So really what we're doing right now is simply um, using the idea of distributed property that we learned in, um, it was unit uh, two. So we're just kind of applying all those rules that we've used before. So everything's kind of hopefully connecting up. Um, so we expand out the brackets and then we end up getting this expression here. Um, now your next step is just to solve your equation just like we did last week. Um, so I'm hoping that this kind of makes sense. Um, what we're gonna do is we are, since we have obviously variables on both sides, you need to, sorry, variables on both sides and numbers on both sides, you should decide first whether where you want the variable to go. Um, as I suggested last week, it's almost a good idea to write down to a little reminder to yourself where you're gonna be placing your variable and where you're placing your number. I would place the number, the, the variable, sorry, on the left-hand side. And the reason for this um, is because 4x is larger than negative 6x. Um, so you look at, you, I would, I would suggest bringing it to the side that has a larger coefficient. Um, and then, of course, if the letters go on one side, then that means that the numbers go on the other side, right? Uh, so I can put the numbers on that side there. Um, <clears throat> so knowing that, I'm going to, my first step is to bring the negative 6x over. And I know I bring it over by simply doing the opposite of subtracting 6x. I add 6x. And I'm hoping all this looks familiar because we did this, uh, we were doing this in the second and the first part of the lesson. So this is just recapping a couple of the strategies from before. There's nothing new here. Um, so we add 6x to both sides and then we know that that will make uh, the negative 6x here go away. And of course I add 6x on both sides to keep the equation balanced. So then I'm left with um, 10x, uh, whoops, I'll skip over here. And then I'm left with 10x minus eight is equal to negative 18. Uh, so now my next step, I look at this and I say, all right, well, there's an odd, there's an odd uh, man out here. The negative eight right there should not be there. It should join the other side uh, where the numbers are. Because of because I decided that the variables, the x's are going to go on the left, the numbers have to go on the right. That's why it's a good reminder to play, to to remind to uh, to write down where your variables are going, where your numbers are going. So you stay consistent the whole way through. You don't want to switch back and forth, right? Uh, so I'm going to move that negative eight over to this side now. And I do this by adding eight and I add eight to both sides. Um, so I add eight to both sides so I can keep the equation balanced. And of course I added eight on purpose so that I could uh, end up with uh, no numbers on the, no constants on their own on the left-hand side. So then I'm left with 10X. Uh, minus eight plus eight, and on the other side, negative 18 plus eight. Let's do the math here. That gives us uh, 10x is equal to negative 10, right? So negative 18 plus 10, sorry, negative 18 plus eight is negative 10. Uh, so now we're left with 10x is equal to uh, 10. Oops, uh, negative 10. And of course, my last step here, and this is what you can see right now, I'm just going to divide both sides by 10. 
I'm going to divide both sides by 10, I end up with negative 1. So, of course, just a little reminder here, this is just recapping all the strategies we talked about already. Um, the reason I divide by 10 is because I'm always doing the opposite operation to eliminate um, to eliminate the number there, right? So I can see here that I am multiplying by 10. So if I want to get rid of the multiplication by 10, I divide by 10. And dividing by 10, what that does, it doesn't necessarily cancel them out. And this is kind of a misconception here. What it does is 10 divided by 10 gives me 1. And then I'm actually left with 1x. And that's exactly what I want because I want to end, I want to find the value of 1x. I don't want to find the value of 10x. That doesn't really help me at all. Um, another analogy for this, I always found this a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> imagine you went to a store and you're buying, you know, chocolates, right? Uh, and then you have you buy five chocolates as an example, right? Um, so the cashier tells you it's $10. So doing a little bit of math here, we know that each of them is worth $2. And I found that answer by dividing by five. So <clears throat> it's the same idea here. Um, essentially what we what we notice is that uh, we end up with, uh, basically think of it this way. It's like you're saying 10 chocolates equals negative $10. I know it doesn't really make sense, but just think of it that way. Um, then that means that each of them individually is, we just have to divide by 10 to find the individual answer there. Um, so again, that's why we're dividing there. So whenever you see a coefficient in front of a variable at the, your last step, um, and you want to eliminate that coefficient in front of the variable, you simply divide, right? So our other strategy is, um, is when we find a common denominator, and this is what we're going to use when we have fractions. Um, and again, this doesn't work all the time. So all these strategies I'm teaching you, it doesn't mean that you're going to use them all the time. Uh, but this is a strategy you can carry out if you have uh, fractions and multiple fractions in your equation. Um, you're going to see we don't do this all the time. Um, and sometimes it's actually preferable not to do it, but um, other times it is better because you end up with integer coefficients instead of you having fractions. Um, and that's going to make your your calculations a lot easier, right? We're still solving the equation the same way, but we're, if we're just trying to find an equivalent equation that's easier to work with ultimately. So the whole idea here is to find the lowest common multiple, which is kind of similar to... So is our, the whole idea here is to find the lowest common multiple, which is a similar idea to what we've done before. And then once you find the lowest common multiple, you're gonna multiply both sides by the common denominator there. And why you do that is because you uh, will purposely end up with um, with integer coefficients and constants. Um, and so basically what happens is your fractions will get eliminated. Um, and it always seems like whenever I do this question, it seems like it's not going to get eliminated, but it will. Um, just trust me on that. You'll see an example. So just a reminder here, you have to multiply every term by the lowest, by the common denominator. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so let's solve this equation here. So first of all, um, this looks scary just because there's a lot of fractions there. Um, so what we can do is we can actually find first find the common denominator, which is in this case 12, and ideally find the lowest common denominator because if you don't find the lowest common denominator, you're going to have to do more work when simplifying. Um, so it's just easier if you find the lowest common denominator. And then what we're going to do is multiply both sides by 12. So when we multiply both sides by 12, um, and again, the reason we're allowed to do that, I just want to remind everyone, is because we are doing it to both sides, right? So as long as we do it to both sides, then it's a legitimate move. We're just multiplying both of these sides by 12. Now, when we do this, we multiply everything inside the brackets by 12. So that means every single term right here is going to get multiplied by 12. So 12 is going to be multiplied by 3 over 4x and 2 thirds, and 12 will be multiplied by 2. So doing a little bit of math here, 12 times 3 over 4x, um, we multiply them together and we will simplify that. And then we have 12 times 2 thirds, which is right here, and then 12 times 2, which is 24. <clears throat> and our next step here, uh, we have um, a fraction here and we're multiplying by an integer. So if, what we can do is we can actually uh, write a 1 in the denominator so that we can multiply the, uh, the two fractions together now, right? Uh, so we multiply across, so we have 12 times 3x uh, is 36x, and 1 times 4 is 4, so we end up with 36x over 4, and then here we have 12 times 2, which is 24, and 1 times 3, which is 3. So what we notice here 
when we first do the math here, it seems like it's getting messier and messier. And a lot of times people are like, well, how is this making it easier? Uh, you will see right now. What we notice is that um, each of these fractions over here on the left-hand side will actually reduce into integers. Um, and sorry, the coefficients will reduce, the coefficients and the constants will reduce into integers, right? Um, so if we take 36 and we divide by four, doing a little bit of math here, we notice that we end up getting nine. So we end up with nine X and 24 divided by three is eight. And this isn't a coincidence at all that these ended up with, um, that we ended up with integer coefficients and constants. Not a coincidence at all. We did that on purpose because we multiplied by the lowest common multiple. So by multiplying by the lowest common multiple, what really happened is we, uh, it's almost like we cross canceled out the denominator, right? Uh, that's the best way to think of it. Um, and actually some of you that know about cross, that liked cross canceling, you liked using that method. Um, you can definitely use cross canceling to help you out. Um, so if you actually go back up here, when we multiply 12 over one times three over three X over four, we could have cross canceled to reduce our, our calculations, right? Um, I don't want to confuse you more, but you could, de can definitely do that just so you know. Um, so now our next step here is to simply, uh, figure out what X is now that we have this easy equation and you look at this and you notice that this is actually much easier to solve. So we can easily solve this one and I won't show too much work for this because I'm assuming you're okay with it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take away eight on both sides and we take away eight on both sides. Um, and again, just, that's just to keep it balanced. We end up with, uh, nine X is equal to 16 and we are almost done now. Now we divide by nine so we can get X by itself and we end up with X is equal to 16 over nine. And I would just leave it like this. Um, I wouldn't try to change the answer there. I would just leave it as 16 over nine. Um, and I just realized I forgot to actually write the answer at the bottom there, probably right out of space. Uh, we end up with 16 over nine. Okay. So um, there's a different way to do this. And I just bring this up because a lot of times when I explain this, I assume that everyone's kind of similar and we, we, uh, we find fractions a little difficult to work with. Uh, some people actually don't mind them. Um, and some of you actually will find that you don't mind fractions at all and you actually find them perfectly fine to work with. And if that's the case, um, that you actually uh, prefer to just work with the fractions, then you definitely don't have to do what I did before. Um, the other way to do this is to simply follow the exact same steps as before. Um, the only difference is that you're gonna have to deal with fraction, fractional coefficients and constants. That's the only difference. Um, so uh, same idea as before. I can almost think of this as just a regular equation. Uh, so first I notice that I have my X on the left-hand side and the numbers are split between the left and the right. So I think it should be pretty clear here that your best move is to move the number to the other side, right? Because the, var because the variable is on the left-hand side, the number should go on the right-hand side. So I'm actually gonna put a line here so I just remember myself. So my X is going to go on the left and my numbers are going to go on the right. Okay. Uh, again, it's a good idea to always establish what, where you're placing your variables and your numbers. So I'm going to bring the two, two thirds over to the other side. So I bring the two thirds over by using opposite operations. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simply take away two thirds on both sides. So I take away two thirds on both sides. And this taking away two thirds basically just eliminates um, the, the number, the constant on the left hand side. And now I'm left with just numbers on the right hand side, which is exactly what I want. Um, so this is already starting to look a little bit better. So then we end up with three over three X over four is equal to six over three minus two over three. Now, if you're wondering how did I get six over three, um, I needed a common denominator, right? So this is going back to the very beginning, unit one. When we subtract off fractions, um, when we subtract an integer, for, uh, sorry, a fraction from an integer, I need to make the integer uh, into a fraction so I can actually subtract. So it becomes two over one minus two thirds. And of course that becomes six over three minus two thirds. Now I can, um, now I can subtract now that I have a common denominator and this gives me four over three. Now this next step is where people get a little bit confused because they're like, I don't know what to do with this funny looking, um, fraction that we have there. So in the same way, and hopefully you remember this from before. So if I have like one over two, uh, so one half times two thirds, I know that I'm allowed to multiply by simply multiplying across, right? 
So I end up with two and um, two over six. And of course that reduces to one third. Um, so in the same way that I can multiply by multiplying numerator, multiplying denominator, I can actually work backwards and I can take a fraction and I can split it up. So instead of me thinking of three or X over four, I can actually split that up as three quarters multiplied by X. And this is the exact same expression as this fraction here, because I know going back to the basics of fractions, um, three over four times X over one, because you know, I just put in one in the denominator. When I multiply across, I end up with three X over four, just like this. So it's pretty easy to, um, to, to split up my, my, my term there. All I'm doing is I'm basically separating my fraction from my, from my variable. And so I end up with three quarters X. So now that I see it this way, instead of seeing it as three X over four, I'm actually seeing it as three quarters is my coefficient. So now if I think to myself, all right, well, what do I need to do to get rid of that coefficient three over four X? This just goes back to the basics that we talked about. Um, you just think to yourself, all right, well, if I have a coefficient in front of X and I want to eliminate it, I'm going to do the opposite operation. Right here, what I'm doing is I'm multiplying, right? So I'm multiplying the, the coefficient uh, three quarters by X. So the opposite, uh, op the inverse operation is to divide by three quarters. So I'm going to divide by three quarters on both sides. So I get four thirds divided by three quarters, which, become, which is the same as really multiplying by four thirds. So I get four thirds multiplied by four thirds and four thirds multiplied by four thirds gives me 16 over nine. And I can leave my answer like that. So I hope that kind of makes sense. So again, some of you might feel more, way more comfortable with working with fractions. And if that's the case, um, just keep solving them the way we've been solving them so far. The only difference is that um, you are just gonna have fractions to work with instead of um, working with integers, but it's the same idea here, right? Um, so obviously because I'm dividing by a fraction, I just have that extra step to multiply by its reciprocal, right? Uh, so just little little changes like that that happen, right? So instead of me dividing by a normal number, I'm dividing by a fraction, which means I multiply by its reciprocal. Okay, uh, so a couple more strategies I wanna go over with fractions. So I specifically kind of picked out um, different equations that all involve fractions, and I'm gonna talk about what the best strategy is in each one. So in that first one, 2x plus 1 over 3 uh, the, is equal to 5. This might seem like it, uh, it could be a pretty crazy one. Uh, but believe it or not, I would say the easiest thing to do in this case is to simply uh, go back to our basic um, example, right? We're going to be, we're essentially just going to be multiplying by 3 first so that we can eliminate the denominator. Um, and then from there, we just carry out our normal operations. So while this one may seem like it might be best to, you know, find a common denominator, multiply it out, you can definitely do that. But I personally think um, because of how, even though there is a fraction involved, because it's only one fraction and because it, we have a whole expression divided by one number there, it's actually quite easy to get rid of that denominator there. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply it by three so that multiplying by three will basically cancel out our three. And then we end up with two X plus one on one side with no denominator is equal to five times three. And again, we multiply by three on both sides uh, to balance the equation. Now we're left with two X plus one is equal to 15. And our next step here is to think to ourselves, all right, well, how do I get X by itself? Well, we're gonna move the one over. So to move the one over to the other side to join the 15, we need to do the opposite of adding one. We subtract one. So subtract one on both sides and we end up with, oops, and I kind of wrote over it, um, 15 minus one, which is 14. The one and the one cancel out. And then we're left with two X is equal to 14. And of course, our, our last step here, we just divide by two so that we can eliminate the coefficient two in front of X. So two divided by two gives us one. And then that means we end up with one X is equal to seven. And of course, I don't have to write one X. I can just write X is equal to seven and I'm done. Um, so moral of the story for this one, if you're looking at that and you're like, so what did we learn? It didn't seem like we really learned a strategy. Uh, no, there was no strategy. The moral of that story was that if you, a lot of times when we see a fraction per quote unquote, because technically it's just division, um, we tend to overcomplicate things, right? And we tend to think that we need to find a common denominator. We need to try 
one of the strategies I taught you in class. Um, you know what? Sometimes it's just normal, um, normal uh, solving methods, right? So we actually did not do any special technique. We just solved it the way we did before using inverse operations. Um, so don't overcomplicate it, right? Um, and again, the hard thing with solving equations is that um, there's not necessarily one method that fits all the time. Um, but you want to just find the most efficient way to do it. And in this case, the most efficient way is just to perform inverse operations, right? So we do, so we multiply by, by multiplying by three at the very beginning, we essentially eliminated any fraction per se. Um, for the next one, um, there is actually a special strategy we use for this. Um, this is called cross multiplying. And essentially the idea here is that you multiply the numerator of the fraction on the left-hand side by the denominator of the fraction on the right-hand side. And then you do the opposite on the other side. Uh, this is much easier to explain in an actual um, diagram here. So what I'm essentially doing is I am taking this, denom this numerator right here and I'm multiplying by this denominator right here. So I'm gonna multiply these two across. And then I am taking on a different set here, I'm going to take this number over here to the denominator on this fraction on the left hand side and I'm going to multiply by the numerator on the right hand side. And then I just multiply across. That's why it's called cross multiplying. Um, so this strategy just want to show you, um, I, I briefly just want to explain why it works. I don't want to go into too much detail. Essentially, the whole idea here is that if I have a denominator here four and I want to get rid of it, I would be doing the opposite of dividing by four, I would multiply by four. And then by multiplying by four, that means that I have on the right hand side, that means I have to multiply by four on the left hand side. And then I start seeing that a four, it will actually technically get multiplied by 2x minus five if I expand that out. So it's kind of the same idea there. I don't want to go into too much detail about it. Um, but essentially, all you need to know for now is that this strategy um, is, is something that you can possibly use. But the main thing to remember is that there has to be a full fraction. A full, there has to be a full fraction on both sides of the equation. So what I mean by that is um, if I had something like x over 2 plus 1 is equal to 3x minus 1 over 4, I can't use this strategy right away. Keep in mind, not right away, because there isn't a full fraction on this side because there's a, uh, I added on the one at the very end. So I would have to actually create a fraction for this whole expression and then, um, and then I could actually do, try cross canceling. Um, this one's a little bit different. So when you get to these kind of problems, they they definitely do get a little more tricky, um, just because of the the timing here. I don't want to I don't want to go into too much uh, detail of, of those questions. Um, of course, there are definitely different ways that we can try that. Um, but for now, we're just going to focus on these type of questions where we have a full fraction on both sides of the equations. So what we would do next is we simply um, multiply the four right here on this, on the, on, sorry, the four right here on the denominator on the, on the right hand side, we multiply it by two X minus five, and that gives us four times two X minus five. And then of course we multiply two times two X minus four. Um, and this is actually not too difficult. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind to remember is that you not multiply the four by two X minus five fully. So we cannot just multiply by two X, we're multiplying by two X minus five, the whole entire expression. So we keep that in a bracket there. Um, so we put the brackets there to kind of emphasize that we are gonna be distributing out. So now our next step is to simply expand out. So then we have four times two X and we know that four times two X gives us eight X. Um, and then we multiply four times negative five, which gives us negative 20. Our next step here, we multiply two times two X, which gives us four X. And then we multiply two times negative four, which gives us negative eight. Um, so our next step, we have 8x minus 20 is equal to 4x minus 8. So what do we do next? Uh, well, our next step here is to move all the, all the variables to one side of the equation. And so what we do is we subtract off 4x on both sides. So when we subtract off 4x on both sides, um, we end up with, like I said, these cancel out. We end up with 4x minus 20 is equal to negative 8. Um, I'm just going to write this on this side here. 4x minus 20 is equal to negative 8. And my next step here is to get rid of the negative 20. So I'm going to bring the negative 20 to the other side. Again, I'm doing this so that because I already have seen that the, the variables are going on the left-hand side, so that means that the numbers should go on the right-hand side. So I do the opposite of subtracting 20. I add 20. 
So I add 20 to both sides. And I know that's actually what I'm doing here. And oops, I forgot to highlight this in red. Um, so I add 20 on both sides. And then this ends up giving me negative 8 plus 20, which is uh, negative 12. Uh, so then I end up with, oh, sorry, positive 12. Negative 8 plus 20 is positive 12. And then I end up with 4x is equal to 12. Um, and then my very last step here, I divide by 4 on both sides. And I think most of you find this pretty easy. Uh, that very last step there, I'm just dividing by 4 because that's the coefficient in front. And then I end up with x is equal to 3. And I'm done. So that is all I had to do in this case. So um, it's actually quite easy to uh, to perform the steps. Like I said, this one, um, my only my only uh, little warning for this is that people sometimes tend to overuse it. Uh, so just a reminder, you can only use it when you have a full fraction on both sides, right? Uh, so even if I had a constant like plus one, plus two, or anything sticking out here, um, I wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't a full fraction on both sides. Um, so we can just quickly check that this answer is correct. I know we'll talk about verifying answers later on, um, but I figured I would just uh, quickly bring this up in this example because of how uh, uh, how big it is. So it's just a quick little way to check that your answer is correct. So how I check if it's correct is I take my answer and I sub it back into my equation and I simply check, does the left side equal the right side? So on the left-hand side, I had 2x, uh, so I'll write the expression up here. 2x minus 5 over 2, that's what I had initially. So that means that I am going to take my 3, which is my supposed answer, and I'm going to sub it back into x, and I'm going to carry out the operations and check what I get for the left-hand side. So 2 times 3 is uh, 6, minus 5 is 1, um, divided by 2 is 1 half. Um, and then I'm going to do the exact same thing for the right-hand side. I am going to take my expression, which is 2x minus 4, over four and same idea i'm going to take two times three which is six minus four which is two and then I divide by four and then of course two over four becomes one half and that's it um so because sorry went a little fast with this one because uh the left hand side equals because i can see that the left hand side does reduce the, the right hand side do we get the same exp same expression on the on both sides and we know that the solution is correct um so uh like i said already cross multiplying it might be tempting to always uh do it but sometimes it's actually better if we just solve by inverse operations so in the very last one um i'm just going to go back to the question so you can see it our last question here is 3x or 3 over 4x minus 3 is equal to 7 and if you actually recall that's the first example um that i gave you in this unit uh to solve and we solved it using technology uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to solve it algebraically now that we have all these methods. So what I'm going to do first is I decide, all right, well, because there's only one variable and it's on the left-hand side, I would I would prefer to keep the x's on the left-hand side and the numbers on the right-hand side. So you see here, especially when there are the other big the other big idea here is that if you gen generally speaking, if you have um, X is only on or a var your variable only on one side, it's probably best to try to just use inverse operations, even with fractions. Um, but again, it's totally your pr preference here. So what I would say is I would, um, I would bring first the negative three over to the other side by doing inverse operations. So the opposite of subtracting three is to add three and I do it on both sides. And again, by adding three, the negative three actually just is gone on the left-hand side. And then I'm left with three over four X is equal to 10. Now I look at this and say, all right, well, what else can I do? Well, I know that um, this, it, this three over four is a coefficient, right? As, and I'm multiplying by X. So I could perform inverse operations. I could divide by three quarters and I could do that on both sides. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing this. Um, I just purposely want to show you a different way you can uh, try to solve this, just to kind of give you different options. So obviously, I could divide by 3 quarters to eliminate the 3 quarter coefficient, um, or I could actually solve this by rewriting it. Um, so what I'm going to do is instead of me rewriting it as 3 quarters x, I can actually take my 3 quarters x, and I can think of it like multiplying a fraction by an integer, so I put a one underneath it and then I end up with three X over four. Um, and the reason this might, some of you might prefer this is because then we don't have to necessarily work with fractions. We're just really working with inverse operations. Um, so I have some term three X divided by four is equal to 10. Well, I know that 
I can get rid of the four in the in the denominator by so really I'm dividing by four. So the opposite of dividing by four is to multiply by four. So I can multiply by four on both sides. And by multiplying by four on both sides, and this is kind of looking like the first example there, um, it actually eliminates um, the denominator completely. Then we end up with 3x is equal to 40. Um, and then, of course, my last step here is I divide by 3 on both sides so that I can get rid of, so that the, the, so that the coefficient in front of x is just 1. And then I end up with um, 40 over 3, which I can simplify into 13 and 1 third. And if you recall, that was actually the answer that we got the very first uh, in the first lesson. So just kind of uh, interesting to show you that, um, you know, that question that seemed kind of difficult. We need a technology to kind of solve it in the, in the first place. Um, now it can be pretty easily solved. So I'm hoping you're feeling co more comfortable with these strategies now. Um, so now the word problem. So setting up the questions, if we have um, so there's two different types of big types of problems that you're going to uh, um face when you're when you're setting up these questions so the first one is when you're setting it up in slope and y-intercept form and sometimes um it'll be setting up kind of a relation between the different variables um, so this is tends to be the more common example that we're going to have slope and y-intercept um that is indirectly given to us in an equation and then we have to set it up so in this question i'm going to speed it up a little bit i hope you don't mind uh, i just want to make sure I don't go uh, too over time here. Um, so when we're when we're talking about um, setting up an equation, we know that we need to find the slope and the y-intercept, right? Uh, for the so the, for the equation of a line here. So what I'm going to do first is I'm actually going to find the y-intercept, and the y-intercept should be relatively easy. It's just where it hits the y-axis, and I can clearly see here um, that for this line that represents how much money is in the account. Um, uh, the y-intercept would simply just be 1,250. It's actually right in between 1,200 and 1,300. Um, so because of that, we know that 1,250 is a y-intercept. To find the slope, um, I could do it in a couple ways. I can either reason through this problem, um, or I could uh, tr I could try rise or overrun. The issue with doing rise or run in this question is the fact that the scale is not going up by one for both axes. So I could try a rise or a run, um, but I it, it think it's going to actually complicate things a bit more. What I would suggest, especially now that you've learned a new strategy from the last unit, is pick two points on this line, um, pick two easy points to read. And in this case, I'm going to pick 0 and 1,250. And I'm going to pick, whoops, and I'm going to pick um, 3 and 1,100. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to subtract off, um, I'm going to find the slope by finding the difference in the y and then dividing by the difference in the x. And again, I'm hoping you're okay with this notation. This just means difference in y and this means difference. And then the delta x means difference in x. All right, so we're just talking about difference. Difference in x and difference in y right there. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to subtract off the y values. And again, when you're subtracting it off, be consistent with this. Um, and you know, so we know if we decide to go in this direction, 1,100, we're going to subtract off uh, 12,500. Then we have to do the same thing for the x. We're going to go in the same direction. Um, and then we end up with negative 50. Now, keep in mind, a big mistake some people will make is they'll accidentally forget the sign and they'll leave it as a positive 50. That's totally wrong, right? Um, and then the, the hard thing with this is once your equation is wrong, then the whole setup will be wrong, right, for the second part. Uh, so just be really careful with that. Um, and again, that's why it's helpful to look at the graph. You know that the slope, the line is going down to the right. So because it's going down to the right, you know that the slope will be negative. So our equation here ends up being negative 50x plus 1,250. Um, and then for part B, it says, when will Marie end up with no money? Well, what we're going to do is um, we know, well, first of all, let's just think about this. If she has no money, that means that the Y coordinate um, which is represents money in this case, because it's on the y-axis here, um, will be zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our equation and we're going to replace our y value with zero. And then all we're going to do is just solve for x. And again, the reason we're doing this is because the question is asking us, when will she end up with no money? So what our goal is, is to find out the number of weeks. And the number of weeks is on the x-axis. So this makes perfect sense that we would be solving for x. 
So we make the Y value, which is the amount of money she has equal to zero. And uh, now we're just solving this equation right here, which might look a little bit different, but it's the same idea as before. You have to think to yourself, all right, well, what do I do first? Well, I'm gonna bring the numbers over to one side. Now, technically there's nothing on this side, right? Um, but I would think to myself, well, since the variable is on the right-hand side, then I probably wanna move the numbers to the left-hand side. So I'm gonna bring the 1,250 to the other side. I do that by subtracting off 1,250. And I think what confuses some people sometimes is that there's, there's a zero on the other side, but really that's just zero minus 1,250, which gives us negative 1,250. And then our last step here is to divide by negative 50 on both sides um, and dividing by negative 50 on both sides uh, to, to eliminate the coefficient in front of X, I end up with 25. So that means it's gonna take 25 weeks for her to end up with no money. Um, our next word problem um, is, this one's a little bit trickier because setting it up is not gonna be as obvious. Uh, looking at the slope and the y-intercept, um, we have to just set up a relationship between the different variables. So because we are asked to find the perimeter, sorry, we're told the perimeter of a rectangle, and then we're told that there is a width and a length, which we don't know either, but we are told how the width and the length are related to each other. This already gives us an idea that we have to, we can set up an equation, right? And we can set up a relationship between all the variables. So let's just start easy. Um, so our two variables are width and length. Um, and let's just, for simplicity's sake, let's make the w equal to width. And now I have to think to myself, all right, well, what would the length be? Well, if, if I'm told that the width is five less than the length, then that means that I would have to add five to the width to get to the length. Um, so I can actually write it like this. I can write it as, you know, the, uh, W is the width and W plus five is the length, or I could technically do this as well. I could let uh, L be the length. And then of course the width would be, um, sorry, let, oops, that's not what I want to say. Sorry, let me just erase that. Uh, since I know that the width is five less than that, then I would simply say let L minus five be the width because I know it's just going to be five less than that. Um, so there's two different ways that I could set up this equation. So I'm going to go with um, W being the width and of course the length being W plus five. So then we have W, W plus five, W, W plus five. So I next my next step is I notice that... Um, uh, to find perimeter, I simply add all the sides of the rectangle. So that means I'm going to be adding up the four sides here. And so I have W plus W plus 5 plus W plus W plus 5. And I add this all up and I end up with 42 is equal to W plus W plus 5 plus W plus W plus 5. And then, of course, I notice that I have uh, four, four uh, like terms here and I can add them up. So I have 1w plus 1w plus 1w plus 1w. And remember, when I add like terms, I don't actually change the, the exponents there. Um, I simply just add them up. And I end up with 4w um, plus 10 is equal to 42. And of course, the 10 is coming from 5 plus 5. Um, now I'm going to solve this equation. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to speed it up a little bit more. I'm going to bring the 10 over to the other side. So I subtract 10 on both sides. Um, and then I end up with 32 is equal to 4w, and then I divide by 4, and I end up with w is equal to 8. Keep in mind, and this happened in the last example as well, um, that technically what I had here was 8 is equal to w. Um, and a lot of people ask, so well, how come you're allowed to just switch it? Because in an equation, um, I can either say the left side equals the right side or the right side equals the left side. It doesn't really change it at all. So this is just uh, my preference. I tend to prefer putting the variables on the left-hand side. I like having the variables on the left-hand side. So in the end, I'm always going to switch it back like that. Um, but you don't have to do that, just so you know. Um, and we already talked about this. Very fine, your answer. So to check if it's correct, you sub it back into the equation and you check if the left side equals the right side. So for this question here, and I'll let you do it on your own, if you want to see if it was correct, I would simply sub it back in, sub in your, uh, your solution 52 into the equation. Uh, and I would split up the left side from the right side and I just check uh, 52 divided by four is 13 and 13 minus 10 is uh, three. So the left side equals the right side. So I know it's correct. And that is all for now.